Hi, this is Will Gethin. Welcome to episode three of Follow Your Blisters, the Hero's Journey podcast. In this episode, I talk with Thomas Moore, a young, inspired psychotherapist and author of Dark Nights of the Soul, the New York Times bestseller, Care of the Soul, and 22 more books about bringing soul to personal life and culture, deepening spirituality, humanizing medicine, and finding meaningful work. His work also infuses mythology, depth psychology, and the arts, emphasizing the importance of images and imagination. In this conversation, we explore Thomas's enthralling metamorphosis from monk and musician to university professor, to psychotherapist, and finally to meteoric best-selling author. He also illuminates the dark night aspect of the hero's journey and shares wisdom for finding what Jung called the gold in the dark. I hope you enjoy the journey. Uh, good morning. Uh, well, it's actually afternoon here in England, but good morning to you, Thomas, over in uh, New Hampshire in the USA, where I believe it's about, um, uh, we'll just start at 11 a.m. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. A beautiful day here in New Hampshire. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, have you been up for long today? You've been up writing early or how's your day evolving? No, no, no. I stay up late at night and I get up uh, a little bit late, so I think I got up at eight o'clock today. Okay, that sounds that sounds uh, civilized. <laughs> uh, so, Thomas, I'm a, I'm a I'm a huge fan of your work, and uh, we of course met um, when I hosted you for a couple of talks in Cheltenham at the Isborne Holistic Centre uh, back in I think it was around 2008. And I'd oh, recently, that, I'd that rec long ago. Wow. Yeah, time does fly, doesn't it? Mm. Um, and I'd recently read one of your uh, many books uh, at the time, uh, which was, I think, the impetus for me calling you or, or emailing you at the time, uh, called Dark Nights of the Soul. Uh, I'd also read The Care of the, Care of the Soul, um, but Dark Nights of the Soul particularly really spoke to me about the time, uh, about that time, about a, a Dark Night of the Soul I'd recently just been through uh, in my own life, um, which ended about 2004. And your book really helped me make sense of that time. Um, just as discovering the hero's journey sort of around the same time or just before I had done. And they were both very useful maps and uh, really shed some light on what I'd experienced and helped me to make sense of it. So I, I, in part, I wanted to interview for this podcast um, as I was struck by the similar pattern of the dark night of the soul and the hero's journey, particularly the dark wood stage of the hero's journey. And we'll talk more about that later. But, I believe, but before I hear about your own uh, the chosen experience of living the hero's journey, which you're going to dis discuss, or we're going to discuss today, um, which may also, of course, be a dark night of the soul. Um, it might be helpful just to um, uh, get a sense of uh, what a dark night of the soul is, or to describe to our listeners um, what a dark night of the soul is and how it can be a useful healing journey or journey of transformation. Well, a, a dark night of the soul, the phrase comes from uh, a Christian mystic, uh, John of the Cross. He wrote a poem called Dark Night of the Soul. He was, he was referring to what happens to mystics say, when they're trying to become, I don't know, trying to rise very high in their meditation and in their, the perfection of their life. But I, I took that phrase to mean the ordinary... Uh, darkness that comes over us in our lives, I think more than once in a lifetime, maybe several times, where you, I, I don't like to use the word depression, that's too clinical for me, but I thought dark nights of the soul would be a good phrase to use for those uh, periods that, uh, where we have great challenge and maybe the feeling of uh, vitality goes away and you feel that you're in a tunnel and you hope that you can get out of it. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Thomas. Um, and before we dive into hearing about your lived experience of the hero's journey and the journey arc that uh, you've chosen for today, I'd love just to get a, a sense of where you were at before that journey began. So if we could just rewind the clock briefly um, for some background, I'm really interested to hear about how you became a monk at the early age of just 13 up until you were 26 a huge chunk of your formative early life. And as you know, I also interviewed your old friend Satish Kumar for this podcast um, recently, who also curiously took that monk's path during his early years. Can you give me a brief overview of your foray into monkhood and um, how it came about and tell me a bit about your time as a monk and how you found that experience? 
Uh, yes, I uh, I grew up in a in an Irish Catholic family in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and uh, it was just a natural thing for a young man who had some. You know, was fairly good at school and well behaved. The the nuns looked at you and said that you'd make a good priest, and I think they kind of shepherded me toward the priesthood. And when I became then, when I was going into my thirteenth year. I had seen people, young men ahead of me, going off to this seminary and monastery, and they were people I admired a great deal. So it was quite natural for me to leave home at that time, although it was difficult to leave my family, very difficult. But I left, and and uh, right away, in, in the first, uh, you know, secondary school or high school years, um, it was a monastic lifestyle with meditation, wearing robes, you know, black robes, and and uh, studying the classics and, and studying Latin and Greek. So uh, I, I, uh, I got right into the monk's life. And then when I uh, went further, advanced further, uh, I went to another city in Milwaukee and then over to uh, the north of Ireland. I was in Northern Ireland for two years studying philosophy. Oh, wow. And uh, that was my first experience in Ireland, and I've since then I've kind of adopted Ireland as my other home. But um, I had a wonderful experience there. But all my courses were taught in Latin for six years. All my the classes I took were actually taught, spoken in Latin, and I had to give my you know do my exams in Latin as well. So that was quite an interesting. Wow, that uh, sounds pr pretty heavy going. <laughs> I uh, I remember I was 19 years old, and the professor asked me the difference between essence and existence, and I had to answer it in Latin, My 19 God. years old. It's kind of amazing now. What I, I don't know how I ever got through it, but I did. So were you and fluent in Latin? I wouldn't say fluent. Some of my teachers were, but I was good enough that I could answer those questions, yeah. Mm. And I could read books and, you know, read the material that I was supposed to study. So, yeah, but it was it was a fairly easy Latin. It was uh, medieval Latin, which is quite easy. But then uh, I reached a point um, after doing all this, living this intense life of the monk for 13 years, I just uh, I began to realize that I was outgrowing it or that I was changing or something was going on. The world was changing. It was the 1960s. There was a lot of change in the air. And uh, and I decided to leave uh, shortly before I would have be become a priest. Okay. And so you, you'd you been studying music all through that, that time and went to music, to, went to university and got a music master's. And I'd, I'd love to hear all about that, really. But to keep on track with sort of the, the focus of the interview... Um, you actually abandoned the career in music that you um, partly sort of felt called for and focused instead on, on on theology and psychology. And could you just give me a little brief overview of how this path progressed, taking us to the point where your chosen journey arc for this conversation began? Um, so, yeah, the studying of yes, theology. Yes, yes. When I, when I decided, I really thought I'd be a musician. I was known as a musician, you know, among my friends and many people who knew me. And uh, I studied composition. I wasn't a performer. And uh, I, uh, I, I decided to go the route of uh, religion and psychology. And so I eventually found my way to Syracuse University, which is a very fine university. And they had a, a wonderful religion department. And I studied there for three years and got a PhD in religion but uh, it was a very broadly conceived degree. It wasn't really, it certainly wasn't, uh, I wasn't part of any particular religion. That, I never would have done that. But uh, it was studying all the religious and spiritual traditions, but also depth psychology and literature and culture in general uh, from the point of view of meaning, looking for meaning. And we felt that was kind of the essence of religion. So even though it was a religious studies degree I got, most of my work was in depth psychology, like the study of Freud and Jung and uh, James Hillman. And uh, so I was intensely involved in that kind of work uh, at Syracuse. Yeah, I think you told me once that you read 20 volumes of Jung twice during that time. 
I did. I read the 20 volumes of his collective works twice. Incredible. The, the first time it was assigned as a, in a seminar I took, and I uh, w read very quickly. And then the next time I chose myself because I really wanted to get it down pat. Yeah. Well, Jung, of course, laid a lot of the groundwork for Joseph Campbell to to create or, um, or sort of develop the hero's journey out of. Um, and um, as we sort of enter now the call to adventure stage, um, to begin uh, hearing about the, your experience of the hero's journey, um, or even the, uh, the dark night of the soul, um, the call to adventure typically starts where the world of the protagonist has been shaken up in some way, be it by a sudden divorce or, uh, or someone dying or even a loss of a job. And out of this um, shake-up comes a call for change in some way, um, uh, typically sort of um, represented by the sort of the, the kind of a sentence like, surely there must be more to life than this. Would this have been true for you, Thomas, at, that, at this time? I would say so. Uh, what it, when it really happened was when I finished my, my uh, doctoral studies, I got a, a teaching job at a university, which is really was my goal. Uh, uh, once I, I gave up on music and the monastery, I decided I felt strongly I'd love to be a college professor and teach uh, this uh, very interesting field to me of religion and psychology where they come together. And so I got this job at a university, a very big and uh, beautiful university. And um, I taught there for seven or eight years, and I figured I'd do that the rest of my life. And one day, the chair of, of the department called me into his office. He was an old friend of mine. And uh, he told me that the faculty had decided not to uh, grant me tenure, which would have allowed me to, to keep teaching. So in that moment, that moment to me, uh, when he told me that I wouldn't be uh, uh, there at the university anymore, I, I felt that was at that very second, that moment, it was a big change. Like I felt the world fall out from under me because mm. that's what I had in mind. And I had no options. I had no other options. I never considered anything else. So that was a big uh, moment for me. And, and he said to me, would you want to appeal it? And I said, not really, because I hear this as a statement to me for my life that I, I should not continue, pursue this any longer to go, you know, to teach at a university. I take your words to be strong words, and they're telling me to move in a different direction. Wow. Um, so... How did the call sort of specifically manifest for you, would you say? Uh, well, it's hard to say. The, the call toward, toward moving in a new direction, uh, I suppose, came primarily when I, when I uh, finished teaching and was trying to figure out what to do. Uh, two or three people came to me and said, would you be my therapist? And uh, I had studied psychology in a, a therapeutically also, so I was able to immediately get a, a license to practice as a therapist. So I opened up a small practice in an office in my home and gradually, slowly began trying to adjust to this different way of life because I never intended to do that. Even though I had studied counseling psychology, um, I, th I thought it would help me as a teacher. I, it never occurred to me I might become a psychotherapist myself, but there I was. So uh, I, I, you know, I did the best I could, and actually, it turned out that I was quite—I uh, was—I felt I was quite good at it from the very beginning. I had a really strong background in depth psychology, and I had a good background in counseling psychology. So it wasn't as bad as I thought. But I still wondered what I was going to do with my life because I didn't think that was the final answer. Right. Yeah. Um, so was there a sort of defining moment when you decided to commit to to taking that, that journey into what was in a sense the unknown because you didn't know what the outcome was going to be? Well, um, I had some help because I was connected to an institute in the city where I was, that uh, where uh, 
my friend, James Hillman, who I consider really the very top psychologist I've ever known yeah. or heard of, really. He was in the same town. We were good friends. We became good friends. And his friends and I uh, did a lot of speaking We gave and teaching in, in this city. And that helped me a great deal to get through it. But still, I felt very shaky because this was not a job. It wasn't even a calling. It was just, it felt like a stopgap, you know, something for the interim. And that was quite uncomfortable to me because I wanted, I wanted more in my life than that. Mm. And often at this sort of this this point of sort of crossing the threshold to begin the journey, um, or after crossing the threshold, a sort of mentor figure a- appears for the person embarking on the hero's journey. And it sounds like Hillman may have been that that person for you, or or, or, or a person who was an important mentor. He, he was, yeah. He he. Not not only did I had I studied him very carefully for years. I had been reading him, and we had become friends when I was at Syracuse. So um, he was very important to me. Not only did he uh, give me this intellectual background, but he also uh, was as a good friend helped me. He really would. He went out of his way to help me through these uh, these difficult times. And to give me support, so I appreciated his mentoring very much. And in the stories and, and myths that the, and fairy stories in particular, there's the mentor often sort of presents a sort of magical gift or talisman. And not that uh, Hillman necessarily gave you such a, a magical gift. It was was there something specific that he that he gave you that uh, that felt really helpful at that time by way by way of a gift. Well, the gift to me was. It's 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 a it's not too concrete, but being with him in ordinary circumstances, he and I would go to to dinner quite often, just the two of us, or we'd go out and do jobs. I mean, we 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 travel and just look at this check check out the city. We we did a lot of things together, and by being with him, I learned I think something some important things about his psychology, and later I. I practice this as a therapist, and I still do today. And I write about using his work a great deal for my work. And uh, so being with him was his gift to me. It was He didn't know he was doing it probably, but he was, he was showing me how to be on as a psychologist. By the term psychologist, what we mean is different from the public. What we mean is someone who studies the soul. Mm. who goes very deep into the psyche, to the soul. So that's the way he lived. Everything, he was always looking at the, the psyche, what was interesting to the psyche and to the soul of people, and everything we did. So I learned how to see soul everywhere and how to be someone who cares for the soul in every single moment of the day, everything you do. Mm. I learned that not from him telling me, but from watching him do it. Well, it sounds like he was a pretty inspiring sort of soul partner. <laughs> he was. He really yeah. was. And um, the, the stage of the journey is on the road stage. is about learning new skills. Um, and, of course, you were learning a lot on your feet and you were being inspired and learning from people like Hillman around you. But what were the most helpful skills that you learned or developed at that time? I think one of the big ones was I learned how to work with images I, I remember when I was still teaching at the university, and I I was working with him, and even then, I um, I remember one day, one particular day, uh, sort of talking to myself in my office there, and I said, I'm going to spend the next 10 years learning how to work with images. And by images, I meant, uh, first of all, dream images, images of dream, and then I thought of mythology, and then uh, literature and the visual arts. So I thought I really wanted to learn how to, how to respond and react creatively and intelligently to images. Mm. And so that was, uh, that was something, that was a skill that I picked up from watching Hellman and, and doing a lot of studies that uh, were uh, all, of, all around us, you know, that we were all doing at that time. Mm. Funny enough, I was just um, before... This interview, I was off, um, uh, take well, sort of sitting in on a, a a sort of workshop of sorts as part of a 
a training program for young offenders um, to sort of turn their lives around and um, kind of get themselves back to work and and so forth. And and uh, I was helping to promote the this charity's work that helps these guys. And um, the leader of the workshop was was talking to the guys and he was talking about the word imagine and how it, it actually means, you know, bringing the image into your head. So, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. um, I, yeah, interesting. Um, this has come up twice in one day. Mm, good, good time. Um, um, and I remember you telling me that you had a lot of success in those early days as a therapist with psychotic patients. And would you say I that did. was um, your extensive study and readings of Jung and mythology were really useful? for for that yes they were very useful for me uh this my studies i it's i thought it was so interesting that my intellectual work my reading jung's collector works twice at the, at the university all of that but all my other studies there too everything that what i learned as a monk what i learned as a musician what i learned uh in studying the spiritual traditions of the world i was especially interested in zen buddhism and uh, Greek mythology uh, and uh, Sufism, all of that came together to give me uh, uh, tools to be a therapist working, I think, in a very different way from the modern therapist. I, you know, I was able to go deep into people's dreams and into their life stories and not take them too literally, but to hear them as the deep stories of their soul. And uh, so it was, it was, uh, uh, it was interesting to me that I was able to deal with people who had uh, extraordinary uh, problems and and uh, issues. Uh, I I didn't feel I, I I didn't feel inadequate or I I felt pretty good because of the background I had, which was intellectual, but I seemed to be able to translate that into action with people quite easily. I think the other part was my my personality, my character. I. Um, I, I, I just, I feel, I, I enjoy being with people, uh, who are not quite together and have, you know, they're kind of loosely put together, maybe just for the moment or going through problems. Mm. Um, I appreciate that. I, I can really do it. Mm. And fascinating that the reading of dreams, do you, do you, have you become a very proficient sort of, uh, articulator of dreams? Well, I I I've got better all the time. I feel it. I I've I improve in that way all along, and even I think in the past year I've made some steps forward. And so uh, I've changed actually my my approach slightly over the years, a little at a time. And I I could never maybe when I first started I could have given a class on how to deal with dreams. At the moment, right now, when people ask me to give a course on dreams, I find it very difficult because uh, it, it, to me, it's more, now it's more of an intuitive practice based on my knowledge and experience. And it's very hard to translate that into uh, clear ideas and, uh, and a method. Mm. Yes, I can, I can imagine. Um, and the on, on the road stage is also about meeting challenges. What what were the core challenges for you at, at this juncture? Uh, one of the big challenges was making a living. Um, when I was at the university, I wasn't paid a whole lot, but at least I had my health uh, bills paid, and I had a uh, pension, and I had uh, you know I had a salary, not not a big one, but I had enough to keep me going. Once I stopped teaching, I had to do all this on my own. And uh, that was a bit of a challenge to try to do what I wanted to do. I didn't want to get a job. I you know, I knew a job would not help me. So I tried a couple of jobs, and they really didn't work at all. So I knew I had to be on my own. And uh, I not, I just, I've never been uh, able to do therapy all day long. It's just not... What I not what I wanted to do. I wanted to write. I wanted to be a writer. Eventually, that became clear. Right. And so. So was the was uh, the was the desire to be a writer? Sorry, um, something that was there from from the beginning, or? No, no. I never felt I was going to be a writer. No, I thought my friends were. I'd have many friends who were good writers. I never saw myself as a writer. But um, what happened was, uh, 
uh, after I had been practicing therapy for a while, and I knew I was doing it in a way that I think most therapists don't do it, I thought, I want to write this. I want to write up what this is all about. I was calling it Care of the Soul, that which is actually, that phrase is a direct translation from the Greek psyche therapy, psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I was calling it that, so I decided to write the book. And once I got writing, this happens to a lot of people, once I got writing, I loved writing so much that I just wanted to keep doing it. And I haven't stopped ever since. I've just been, and I do identify myself now primarily as a writer. Mm. So just um, rewinding a second, because I, kn- I know that uh, um, your first book was it was a really great success. And I have a sense that um, the dark wood stage of the journey, which we were just sort of probably entering with your financial challenges. Oh, um, yes. Um, I have a sense that 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 that, that, that the the care for the soul may may come out of that that uh, that that part of the journey. So, so the dark wood for you, when, when the, the in a sense the protagonist or your, you came face to face with your greatest challenge or fear on the journey, what was was that? Do you think the, was that uh, the fear of of not having enough money or, or the obstacle of not having enough money? Was that the main thing you? You, you had know, to I move never through? needed. I never needed much money. Uh, when I was living by myself, I didn't really need much. I, I didn't make much, and I, and I, I felt fine. I, did, yeah. I, had a per, I had a good life. Mm. But uh, I, I also knew that my life really wasn't, I wasn't on an ad, my adult, in my adult phase yet. I felt I was still too young and trying to, uh, still having to really find my place in, in the society and in life. And I did want to do something more. So that was difficult for me because everything I tried did not work. And uh, uh, so it, uh, I was unsteady uh, really until I turned 50, 50 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time, um, I, I got through this phase. But up until then, I think the biggest challenge for me, the dark wood you're talking about, I think was mm-hmm. that the, I couldn't make it in the world too well. I, I applied for teaching positions and I was re- rejected. I, I sent manuscripts to uh, publishers and was rejected. So I had a, I had a period of a lot of rejection and um, not being able to really find my place. Okay, and so moving through that, you, you, you started to write this book, Care, Care for the Soul. Um, and tell me about that, that book and how that came about? It was a book, as I said, uh, primarily based on my experience now as a therapist. Yeah. And all of my ideas. I felt that I had got a lot of good ideas from Jung and from Hillman yeah. and people associated with them. And uh, th- that included the study of a great great deal of oh, very ancient texts, you know, very ancient books and you know, Plato, and uh, I, I studied Renaissance uh, magic, Italian men- Renaissance wow. magic, and and uh, astrology. I mean, I studied a great deal of things, you know, intellectually, did a great deal of study. And I, and I felt that I could put that together in a way that the ordinary person might be able to understand it. The, here, the thing I often say about that is that my father was a plumber, I did not come from a family of intellectuals, or wow. no one went to college in my family, or university in my family at all. So I was the first, and it wasn't natural for me to be in that realm of the intellectual. So I thought that maybe I could, I could write this, write these ideas in a language, in a way that uh, the average person might understand. I didn't want to write down in any way, but I wanted to. I wanted to write in language. I felt if you could, if if you can't put something in plain language, and it probably isn't worth talking about, so I decided to uh, to write this book in a way that people might be able to understand. It's still beyond a lot of people. Some people find it difficult, but it's on that edge. All my writing, I feel, is on the edge between the academic intellectual and the ordinary person. Okay, and that book ended up being a, a huge success. I think it, yes. it's. I think you told me it's it sold three 
million copies worldwide to date, uh, yes, approximately yes. at this time. And yes. did you get much of an advance at the time? Yes, that was another thing. I had no money, and uh, I I found an agent through a friend, and uh, the agent uh, arranged an auction to auction this book off to a group of maybe ten publishers, and uh, he called me and and he said, "Well, you know, they've uh, they're offering us something like I don't know, hundred fifty thousand dollars for this book," and to me that was like a five million dollars you know it was so huge because i wasn't making much at the time this was quite a number of years ago 30 years ago now so you know money was different then but um it was a it was a big chance that was like the first thing that helped me then create my life and it was then that i met my wife who i am married to now and uh, my daughter was born shortly after that so uh, it was just in time the right timing of being able to not only make money from this book, but to have a job, have a work to do in life that was not a job. And that's what it gave me, and it still gives me. Wow. That one book still gives me my life. So really, sort of turning that period around time of turning 50 was a huge time of really coming into your own. Um, it was. Whether it's a smorgasbord of treasures from you know, a, a huge book deal and a a marriage and a child. You must have been sort of <laughs> hitting the sort of new peak of bliss in your life around that time. Was it, yes, did, did it, it was, feel amazing? Was it was it really, do you remember it as a really sort of a fantastic sort of really joyful time? Or I guess with, was. With, with that, there's no doubt lots of challenges that are lurking as well because there's quite a lot of stresses to make it all happen and you're going out into the world. And But I guess, yeah, it must have been a happy time. Oh, generally, it was a very happy time, yeah. Definitely mm. a very happy time. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It was. It was also a time that was a little difficult to deal with because suddenly I was in demand everywhere. People all over in different countries and different fields. People in medicine and people in you know in religion and spirituality. All these people were asking me to come to them. And suddenly, I had so much work to do. It was way beyond me, and it took me a while to figure out how to deal with it all. There's the saying, well, the saying, but also people. Sometimes people say that it's almost sort of better being on on the journey to where you want to get to. When you get there, it's like, oh no, now I've got to deal with the reality of what that means. It's not just the fun, creative part of dreaming and visioning and getting to that place. You're actually there, and you you have a whole new load of challenges when you get there. Well, it was much. Those challenges were a lot easier to deal with than the ones before. I was very happy to. Yeah to have that uh, development. And some people, astrologers, might say that that was at my Saturn return at 50. Right. So, you know, it was a time when things happened in a lot of people's lives, and it certainly happened in mine. That's interesting. Yeah, I had a, I had a very big Saturn return at 28. Um, mm -hmm. Is my next one at 50? Or I mean, I've probably had some... It's every, every seven years, isn't it? Yes. So I've had some... Um, in the meantime, but 50 is like going to be a big one for me, presumably in, in the next, uh, well, I, I turn 50 in a couple of months' time. So, oh my goodness, that's, that's all, all ahead of me. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, so, the publishing deal, in a sense, or well, this whole you know thing of a, a, a book deal and, and getting a life and um, having money problems solved and having a, a new family, that was the treasure of your journey. Um, but I'm sure it's brought you um, also a life of, of meaning and purpose um, with many wonderful books then sort of to write in the future going forward. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, does that feel like the treasure really for you? Oh, absolutely, yes. It was. Um, it was a, a just, just what I was looking for. Uh, I, I was looking for a way to be in the world and it really put me in the world, you know. I mean, in a way, I, I when I when I first started writing, I didn't. I was just thinking of local people around me might read my book, and then when I published uh, Care of the Soul, people from many many countries are writing to me, and many different sorts of people from all over the world. And I I had to change my whole perspective and realize now I have to be part of this bigger world. And that was wonderful, but at the same time, it it, re, it uh, asked for a, a shift in the way I saw myself. So I think we've now entered the return stage of the hero's journey, where 
uh, you return with something to share with the world and you're putting out your message in the world and uh, your life's work in a sense has been about helping people to connect to their soul um, so would you say that in essence has been what you returned with with to share for the for the greater good the yes those yes I think that was the main thing that I had something now to do and to offer the world and uh, people were very but still I still even this morning I, I've received messages from people in various places telling me that they have uh, how much the books have meant to them so that happens to me every single day, and it probably has every day since for the past 30 years. So, you know, puts me in the world, uh, and that was a great gift. So that gift keeps coming to me. That's great. That's, that's wonderful, Thomas. Um, the other thing about returning is that sometimes um, the protagonists can, can feel like they don't necessarily fit into their old world anymore, and they can be hard to adapt to the the new changed person they are. Um, um, did you find that at all? Did you find it difficult to adapt having sort of returned in essence with your book? Yes, there were certainly challenges. I think the uh, most difficult one at the beginning was that I was asked to given so many invitations, interesting invitations to go places that it was, you know, and I had a small family. My wife had a child uh, three years old when we married, and and uh, we had our child, our daughter, together right then. So we had little children. And uh, so I was, I, you know, if I look back on it, I was uh, away too much, and that was a challenge. How do you stay home and take care of your family and go out into the world who was just asking you, you know, grabbing at you all over. How do you do that? I don't think I did it terribly well, but uh, uh, that that changed over time a bit. And and uh, it's really interesting now during the times of COVID for me to be sitting at home and not traveling at all, because that's been part of my life since then, of going around the world and yeah. talking to people everywhere. Well, having just um, similarly to you, just had my first child, um, now 49 my 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 little daughter is just just past one and uh, I yeah I can completely relate to how challenging that must have been from that respect of having this child wanting to be a father and show up and be there for the child but also having the world sort of putting all these demands on your time and taking you off to various trips so yeah I can I can see that would have been very difficult to, to navigate it is yeah, yeah. it was yeah, yeah. um so reading the reading Dark Nights of the Soul, I was struck, um, as I said, between the similarities between a hero's journey and a Dark Knight of the Soul, um, especially the Dark Wood stage of the journey. Um, but the Dark Wood and the sorry, but the Dark Knight of the Soul and the hero's journey involve uh, they both involve similar things like facing fears and the shadow and death and rebirth and finding the gold in the dark, as Jung put it, um, of becoming more of who you are. Um, and also uh, turning self-interest into broader concern. Um, I wonder, can you elaborate any more about how these two different maps kind of reflect each other? Well, one way that comes to mind uh, is that uh, in the dark night of the soul, and John of the Cross says this, and uh, I, uh, Hillman used to say this, this message all the time, that the darkness itself gives you a gift. In other words, you don't go into the dark to find something light and bright, something that you can understand and something that is joyful right away. Actually being in the dark and struggling and feeling fearful and wondering if you, ever, you will ever get out of it, that is the light. That It's a dark light. It's mm -hmm. a black light. It's not, it's not something other than the dark, you actually are, uh, you are transformed by the dark, not by a light in the dark. And I think that's, uh, that's really the key. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Even people who teach this about, uh, about the hero's journey, that it's not as sweet and as bright as sometimes it's described. Mm. Um, you, you have to 
uh, I know as a therapist, what it was, a lot of times what I have to do is just help people have the endurance yeah. to stay with it rather than to always look for ways out of it. Yeah, I absolutely resonate with that, Thomas. And I, I remember reading that in Dark Nights of the Soul about your expressing that by having a relationship with one's darkness, um, you actually can have a happier life. Um, but it's not, you know, through just sort of connecting to some bright sort of happy experience in that sense. Um, and I, yeah, I really resonate as well with how you described the sort of this, you know, when in a dark night, sort of, I think you refer to Hecate, the, the patroness of, of darkness, the, the lunar light spirit, as you described her, as sort of shining, um, not a brilliant light that, you, that one might hope for on, on the, the darkness or to clarify what, what we may be, the uncertainties or the things you want to find out, but more just sort of giving little intimations and hints. And it's like a, a sort of gradual sort of enriching process and darkening and process rather than, oh, I've now worked it out. It's sort of a very subtle um, imbuement that sort of grows and, and uh, uh, yeah, kind of takes you somewhere. If you could sort of maybe uh, clarify that a little bit. One, time, one thing I often say when I give workshops, I, I explore with people how to be in touch with their lunar nature, mm -hmm. not just their solar nature. So this idea of sun and moon is very traditional. It's been used as basic principles of life you know, for centuries. So I, I, I talk about that. That's Hecate and, to some extent. And so it's she's the moon goddess. And... and uh, I think that is possible then to realize that that to be a really intelligent and uh, a person with real values, you don't have to be solar, sun-like, and cheerful all the time. You can be in a place where in your ordinary days, when things are not going perfectly, when maybe you wish you had a different job or different work to do, Maybe you're not really thrilled with the relationships uh, you have in your life. That's the lunar life. That's that's lunar life. That's living in that outer blackness, but where the light is dim. It's not solar. It's not bright and cheery. So uh, I think that's really a, a very useful way to think of, of human life because if we think that it should be cheerful and sunny, then we're always going to be disappointed and have an extra layer of disillusionment. But if you realize, understand finally that life, even at its best, has this dim lunar quality to it and live it. And no, that's not, you also have a sunny part, but this is important as well. I think you can get along in life a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think it sort of makes me remember that book by M. Scott Pegg, um, uh, I forget the title of the book, but he talked about how life is a struggle. Once you accept the struggle, it, it, it ceases to be such a struggle. Mm. Um, but that, the yeah, road less taken, maybe? The, the road less traveled, yeah, exactly. Less traveled, that's right. Yeah. And I also heard that someone said the other day that I think Jordan Peterson did a podcast interview recently where he talked about relationships and said something like that, you know, if your relationship's less than 50% perfect, you tend to moan and think, oh, God, I need to change relationship. But actually... If it's if it's so easy and works, there's a there's a problem there. It's it's, yeah, the, right. it's it's the challenge is important, and you have to work with that, not right. sort of run from it and think you need to be better or easier. Yeah. Um, in Dark Nights of the Soul, you also talk about um, how what is often diagnosed as depression can actually be a Dark Night of the Soul, which, if left unmedicalized, can in fact be very transformational. Um, you describe depression as a psychological sickness and a Dark Night as a spiritual trial. Can you expand on the difference between the two, if there is a difference between the two? Between the dark depression night and, and depression. Or yeah. depression. And, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, it's at some level they're prob they probably overlap. But I think when we use the word depression, we tend to take our darkness into the realm of medicine. And we're more likely to treat ourselves than with, and others to treat us with medication. Because uh, and and that's fine. I I have always been in favor of medication uh, for certain people who are depressed. That it, it does help at some levels. But it's a different thing. 
even if you are depressed clinically and are taking meds for it, and I've got this message from many, many people, readers who have told me this, mm -hmm. that you can, even so, even if, even if you are depressed, you can still see your depression as a dark night and find meaning in it mm. and okay. be transformed by it rather than just try to get rid of it at all costs. And I find I've had many clients in the, over the years who come to me depressed. It's not easy to deal with depression. But I find that by, uh, by, by making that shift toward the search for meaning, that this is a meaningful experience, uh, people get used to that. And they don't want to go back to the notion that they are medically depressed. Uh, and it becomes very important to them. In fact, even sometimes I may slip up and forget myself that what I'm doing with it. And they say, wait a minute, stop. We're talking here about a dark night, not about a depression. Okay, yeah. And when, when would you know, or when would a, a doctor know when, when to treat someone with, with antidepressants rather than let them have a, a, the transformational experience? I'm, well, I, what I'm saying is that I think you can do both. If yeah. you feel that, if the doctor feels that meds are are helpful, if he's not just, you know, over medicating people, but really thinking it through. Uh, if a person then, and there there are a lot of people who could benefit from medications. If they do, they can still at the same time. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Yeah, find yeah. somebody else to to, to yeah. translate that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you're right that it, that artists often create their best work out of emotional darkness um, and recommend in, in, in your book about that anyone going through a dark night uh, express their experience in images that convey their personal truth, which, of course, yourself, you do via your writing your books and others write songs or poetry. But can you say a little bit about the power of expressing a dark night in words and um, maybe give some guidance for how this can be practiced effectively? Uh, that's sure. That's one of my favorite themes. In fact, when people ask me about that book, Dark Nights of the Soul, the first thing I think of is the role of the arts and beauty in uh, Dark Nights. So in terms of expressing and, and finding images for the Dark Night, uh, I think that uh, you can do that, as you say, in many different ways. You can do it with words by just writing a diary or just letting the words come out of you. Um, or you can uh, do it by, uh, by painting and sketching and drawing. Or you can do it with music, writing music, or, or playing music, either playing it yourself or just having music playing around you. And the idea is, and this is a very ancient idea, that you can do two things. One is to play cheerful music or to make cheerful images to offset some of the heaviness of the dark night. That's okay. But they say, the traditions say, that doesn't really cure the dark night. It doesn't really help it. Uh, it's a temporary thing. Mm. Um, the alternative is to play music that is that takes you deeper into your dark night and allows you to feel it more deeply and maybe reflect on it. And so I would say, let's say if you were in a dark night and you wrote a poem, if that's your your thing, if you can write poetry, write a poem about your experience, that will give some objectivity to your subjective experience of the darkness. Yeah. And that gives you some relief, just having it outside yourself. Yes, yeah. There you can see more about it because a lot of times we don't know much. All we have is this emotion. And what we need is some something beyond emotion that helps us see the nature of the dark night and what is going on. It does have content. Some people think it's just a mood, but the dark nights do have content. They may go back in childhood. They may be, uh, your, your reflection may take you way back into your early years. That's very common. We think the dark night is something going on in the present, and often it is something from long ago. Yes, yeah. So yeah, I can really... I can see uh, the, uh, writing and expressing in these ways can sort of bring, bring, bring things out really onto paper or, or you know, in, into the light in a sense, um, bring them into into sort of clarity in some way. There's, I'd like to say another thing about that. 
Mm. Uh, in the Middle Ages, Saturn, the god Saturn, or the planet Saturn, was called, um, well, he was, he was the patron of artists. And artists were called those people born under Saturn. And it's funny because Saturn is the, also the planet and the, the god of depression. Oh, wow. So there is inspiration in that depression. Yes. And beauty. I think what we have to understand that that real beauty, when, when you see beauty in the world, that's very real. It is not sentimental. It has some darkness to it. And and so that's important to it's not entirely dark usually, but it has some darkness. And some darkness has I mean darkness usually has some beauty. And if you can be in touch with the beauty, that helps you get through it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Um, now, you mentioned um, to me before that you actually had breakfast with Joseph Campbell uh, on a couple of occasions. Can you tell me how that came about? Yes, I was at the Syracuse University, and one of my professors, Houston Smith, was a, a very well-known, at the, at the time, a very well-known person in the field of re world religions. And he was, uh, he was invited to go to the conference I forget what it was, a conference of spiritual leaders and teachers. And he asked me if I wanted to go with him. He thought I might like to uh, see what was going on there. It was quite a ways away. We had to fly up a couple thousand miles, I think, and get there. And we were uh, uh, on the bus from coming from the airport to the, uh, the setting of this conference. And I heard this person in the back. I felt he was kind of pontificating. He was talking very loudly in a very strong uh, New York accent. And, uh, and uh, I thought, what is, who is that person? And it was Joseph Campbell. And uh, he was, he, you know, people love to hear him because he was such so good at, uh, at expressing himself and finding good language for the difficult ideas he was trying to convey. And then when we got to the conference, I think we were there for at least a week. So I had plenty of opportunities to, uh, to meet everybody there. And one of them was Campbell. And we arranged to have breakfast a couple of times so I could talk to him at length about some of the questions I had uh, in relation to his work. And was he able to, to answer your questions? Yes, he was, he was, uh, he was very good, you know. He, um, I, I, I mean, I have to say, those of us in the field of religion, we were probably religion snobs, you know. We felt <laughs> that we knew so much better than people we had studied. Very, we thought that Campbell the, was kind of a popularizer, and he took ideas that we studied in great uh, detail. He kind of made them quite simple. And so that was something that, um, an aspect of his work that some of us didn't appreciate too much. But actually for myself, I spent a lot of time, I, when I was a doctoral student, I read The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And I read, I made a point to read all the mythologies that he referred to. It was like an education in mythology for me to do yeah. it that way. So I don't, I don't think he was, you know, he didn't go into all the details that a scholar would like to have. But he, he could speak to to intelligent people about mythology, and um, I was I was interested in talking to him because even then I think I knew that's what I wanted to do in a certain way myself. I wanted not to write down to make things too simple, but I wanted to be able to find language, well written, that the average person could read and might find some challenge, but be able to read and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Um, Campbell's biographers, in their biography, Fire in the Mind, um, on Campbell, um, write about how George Lucas, the creator of the Star Wars films, which of course used the hero's journey uh, template, I think it was the first film to consciously use it, and, and many others who knew Campbell would comment how radiantly alive he was and how he had this sort of life force pouring out of him. Was, was that your experience? Yes, it was. He was, he was just full of, he was full of energy. He was also, as you would expect someone like that, a bit cantankerous, you know, he, cantankerous. Uh, he was easily annoyed. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> and he never suffered fools. That's for sure. So I would say that half the time you were with him, he was complaining about something, you know, he was, he had that streak. Oh, in did him he? That, right. 
uh, but I liked it myself. In fact, at one story, he, he and I were sitting together next to each other at this conference. And this man got up to, and, and he was trying to, give a, to teach us something about energetic flow or something, some, you know, kind of, I, I felt it was a new age kind of thing. And he asked everyone to stand up and make a fist and shout and, and uh, force their fist, you know, wave their fist. And Campbell and I, we didn't talk to each other. We just sat there. We did not stand up. Either, I think we we're the only two people in this room full of people who sat, would not refuse to stand and do this thing. I think Campbell, because he recognized that kind of a Nazi uh, background to it, and I just felt it was like people getting, losing control, and that is the dangerous thing. I thought it was psychotic. So I decided not to do it. And the two of us together decided spontaneously not to stand. Okay. <laughs> the rebels. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um well, I, I, I sort of yeah put down this idea of his this life force radiant figure being because he had followed his bliss and you know really followed the, his fascination with myths and mythology and his work that developed with the hero's journey and um, and yeah sort of really followed his inner, his inner pulse um, and so yeah his mantra follow your blisters which of course became later follow your sorry follow your bliss which became follow your blisters um, when he updated it later but. Um, you actually reminded me recently that he he started out that mantra as follow your weird, W-Y-R-D, i.e. follow your fate. Um, and in Dark Knight of the Soul, you write about the crucial role that fate plays in most dark nights, suggesting that we should cooperate with the signs of our destiny, even when we'd rather move in a different direction. And you write about the daemon, as in the Greek word, describing it as a strong inner drive or spirit that urges you towards your fate, often against your will. And I wonder if you could just explain how this connection to our daemon works and how this relates to Campbell's initial idea of following your fate. It's very close. Um, the fate and weird would be uh, to follow, uh, to pay attention to what you are called to. What are you called to be and to do? And how does that affect every day of your life, to have that sense of your fate in mind as you go through your life and be loyal to it? And uh, if it changes now and then, to change with it. Or it may not be clear at first, and it may take your whole life to be more clearer about what it's asking you to do and to be. I think in most people's lives, you, you discover it. Like for me, I thought it was at 50. I began to see what my fate was. And mm. I didn't know it before then. Interesting. But, yeah. um, so, and I had to, am I going to be loyal to it or am I going to, uh, I could exploit it. I think some people do exploit those things. That, uh, someone asked, people were asking me to create schools and uh, uh, training programs and what I was doing. I felt that was that would be a betrayal of my fate. I felt that that's not what I was called to do. I was called to be a writer to write as an individual person and not to create any kind of school. So I didn't do it. I didn't think it was my thing. It wasn't what I should do. It was an ethical decision, I think, mm. not to do that. And so I didn't think about it afterwards. I know people may, may, made a lot of money doing that sort of thing, and I didn't worry about that. Um, I don't care because I think it's terribly important to follow your fate. Now, now the daimon, I call it daimon because in the Greek it's, uh, it's spelled differently. The daimon is uh, is something a little bit different in that it is felt more as an inner guide, a strong, forceful, energetic inner guide. And um, uh, this is d discussed by many people, like uh, Socrates talked about his daimon, and um, uh, W.B. Yeats discussed his daimon, Hillman talks about the daimon, Jung writes about the daimon frequently. So And Rollo May, the wonderful psychologist, uh, uh, wrote a great deal about the daimon. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a common thought in some ways that in adept psychology, what I would call real soul psychology, uh, the daimon plays an important role because that inner sense of who you are, what guides you, it's a little different from fate, which is a little kind of way out there and beyond you. The daimon you feel inside uh, Socrates says you feel it more as telling you what not to do than what to do. I'm not sure that's true of everyone, but for him that was true. 
But I find that the daimon is, is this inner thing, the inner guidance that uh, may urge you to do something and it may uh, get a hold of you and you do, can't stop thinking about some thing you want to, you want to do or to accomplish. And uh, it might be some strong inner urge not to do something. At any rate, following the daimon, all these teachers I mentioned to you recommend following the daimon. Mm. And uh, I think even some poets, like I'm thinking Anne Sexton, American poet, uh, wrote, she didn't use the word daimon, but she used the word angel, I think, in a similar way. So it's it's a teaching that we can listen to. Emily Dickinson, too, writes about, uh, similarly, about the daimon. So I would, I, she doesn't use that word, but... Um, Anyway, we have all these people teaching us to follow our daimon, and I think that's really essential. Mm, okay, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I'll look, at, I'll look into following my daimon. Maybe like you, I'll, I'll, I'll also sort of discover my, 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 my fate to follow at, at sort of around 50. <laughs> yes, I, I, I hope so. I wish that for you. Um, and you're currently working on a, on a book called The Jade Sutra's Nine Gateways to Bliss, which... Um, you kindly slipped me a sort of uh, an introduction, a first chapter mm -hmm. on to get a to get a sense of it. And um, the sutras um, are in the in Eastern wisdom tradition, rules of life. Um, I yes. gather, and the the bliss here that is sought mirrors the Sanskrit word you explain, Ananda, which yes. um, is so often written about in India's great spiritual writings, the Upanishads. And Ananda, of course, is the word from which Campbell found his inspiration for folly or bliss. And yes. you describe Ananda as referring to, I quote, the utter joy of being in tune with yourself and the universe. Yes. And the book shares nine keys to access this Ananda quality. Can you share just one of these ways, uh, perhaps the most important one? To, yeah, uh, well, I, I go through several, uh, kind of in a row, in the, there are nine. So the first one is the relationship to the infinite. I think it's terribly important for us to have an opening out of this closed world that we live in. Science really has opportunities for us to look into the world and gives us teases into a bigger world. But I think the religions and spiritual traditions are important in making a much bigger uh, rip, tear, opening in that closed universe in which we live. It's terribly important to have that. Now, some religions, uh, maybe all religions, there's most of them, eventually close that opening. It closes up because religions lose their, their initial uh, visions very often, and they become closed systems. Uh, that's unfortunate, but it's the way religion works, uh, I'm afraid. But uh, if you can find a teacher or a system or, uh, or writings that can help you open yourself up to a world that is mysterious, that is not fully described and, and researched and understood, and that there are mysterious things happening in, the, in our everyday lives. And if you can live that way with the openings to the mysterious, um, that is a way to live with the infinite. And I, I make that my first step in these nine steps towards Ananda. Uh, I'd like to also say, you mentioned my good friend, uh, Satish Kumar. Yeah. Uh, a, a number of years ago, I was uh, at uh, down in Devon with Satish, and uh, he he gives talks at Shumarka College there. He he did anyway every week. He'd come and give a talk, kind of a fireside, simple talk. And he asked me one day when I when he came, he said, "What would you like me to talk about today?" For because I was teaching there for three weeks and I had students there, and I said, "Please talk about Ananda." And I'll never forget uh, Satish's talk about Ananda. He did not talk about it in these exalted spiritual terms. He talked it about it as the joy in everyday living, oh. the joy of eating well and eating good food, the joy of taking a walk in the woods or by water. Those simple joys, he said, is what Ananda is at root. And I think that's an important part of this whole business, too, that we are not necessarily looking for some ultimate perfection of ourselves. We're looking for joy in life, joy yeah. in life. Yeah, in, in the simplicity of life without overcomplicating yes, right. it. Yeah, simple things. 
Um, great, Thomas. And um, is there anything else you're working on right now? Um, yes. You, you mentioned, I think you have, even have a novel um, on the go. Yes, right now. I do. Let me talk first about, I have a book about to come out next May called uh, Soul Therapy. So uh, it's written for mainly for therapists, but really for anyone who counsels others, like lawyers or doctors or even parents with their children or everyone counseled. We all counsel each other at times. Yeah. So I'm writing this book to try to be open to anyone, but it's especially for therapists. And what kind of essentially what I think are the important things to know if you're going to be a therapist. And uh, I've, uh, uh, I write fiction. I've only published one book of fiction. I wrote a set of short stories about golf, the okay. playing golf. I love them, but you know, a lot of people I think think they're a little strange and crazy. But I, <laughs> I really like them, and uh, but I don't publish my other fiction, the long fiction. But I'm writing a, a detective story right now. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's That's uh, a bit, bit of a it, departure. It is a departure. I love reading them though. And all those years when I traveled to give talks on planes, I'd often read detective stories. <laughs> and I see, I think there's a place, there's a connection between the mystery of detective stories and the mystery that I'm talking about in terms of the spiritual life, those mysteries. Uh, it's very interesting. I think there's more going on in detective stories than we realize. Oh, and so I write. I wrote this one, and the sub, the subplot, the underlying theme of this story, this detective story, is that Jesus was a Buddhist. That okay. Jesus began as a Buddhist. So I'm able to explore this interesting theological theme of the influence, possible influence of Buddhism on Jesus, and uh, with all of its uh, controversy. But explore within a fiction, and I really enjoy that. And do you think he he actually was a, a bit a Buddhist, or or <laughs> well, in, integrated? Fiction, you know. But 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 do you think he might he might have been? I mean, there's a book, isn't there? Jesus yeah, I think Jesus it's lived died, might. lived in India or died in India or something. Yeah. Well, it's not that one so much as uh, that's certainly true. I don't know about that. There were we do know. It's interesting. As I've read that. Uh, there were three ships leaving the area, general area where Jesus lived. I mean, on the Mediterranean, ships leaving for India per week in his lifetime. It's very possible he could have gone there. There were people coming down from India into his area before his lifetime. Um, and they settled in, uh, in near Alexandria, right outside Alexandria, Egypt. And there are some scholars today who really think the evidence is strong to at least consider that these were Buddhists who had a community in Alexandria, and it's possible that Jesus uh, was there. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I think it's an interesting thought. I, I like it myself. I, uh, it's not just about trying to get religions together, but to give a much deeper background to who Jesus was and what his teaching is. Well, that sounds that sounds interesting, Thomas. I look forward definitely to reading that novel. Um, finally, Thomas, um, I think I think you're now are you are you 80 years old? Is that correct? I am not yet. Uh, please give oh. me one more month. <laughs> oh, apologies, apologies. <laughs> Jump, jumping ahead there. Well, anyway, I have one, mo I have one more month. Uh, okay. October. I was going to ask when your birthday is because mine's October eighth. Mine's November the twenty fourth. Yeah, so we're we're pretty close. Yeah. So well, I'm uh, on October eighth. I turn eighty. Yes. Well, you you look amazing for for seventy nine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, probably because you've you've uh, followed or lived in tune with your an Ananda or your bliss. I imagine, I, 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 imagine, I, ima I imagine that's a lot to do with it. And I know you have a book out now as well uh, about aging called Ageless Soul, The Lifelong Journey Towards Meaning and Joy. And my last question is, what do you feel is the secret to a happy and meaningful life? Both, it, both in life and in later life, of course. Yeah. Uh, I think, the, uh, I think the, the secret is really to... There, there are many secrets. One is to be yourself, to live your life and not a life that someone else wants you to live. To live your life and to go in the directions that it's asking you to go in, whether they seem reasonable or not, and whether other people approve of them or not. So I see life as like tacking in a sailboat. You know, you move, back, you don't go in a straight line. Yeah. You go, you go crooked and you go in a crooked path. 
And uh, therefore, if you can remain on that crooked path for yourself, I think you have a good chance of, uh, of aging well. In fact, the way I put it in this book is that uh, aging doesn't mean to get older. It means to, uh, to have been affected by life. Uh, I, I made the comparison to cheese. Um, aged cheese is not the same as old cheese. Yeah. If you have an old piece of cheese lying around your house, you don't want to ha eat it. But if you have aged cheese, you might even pay a lot more for it. We are aging as we say yes to life with its in strange and odd invitations. We are not aging when we avoid those moves in life because of, you know, that we, 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 they're too uncomfortable or they don't seem wise. So I think we have to be a little bit foolish in life and follow, follow our own uh, uncharted direction and twisting direction. And if you do that, I think there's a good chance that you will age well and find happiness. That sounds like excellent advice to me, Thomas, and, and uh, advice that I fully resonate with. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really fascinating to, to cover this ground of Dark Nights of the Soul and the hero's journey with you and, um, and hear about some of your other work. Um, is there, I know you've got an online course um, in psychology. Well, what's, what, what's your online course again? The course I'm teaching this year is called Soul Psychology. It's a series of six courses. Each one takes six weeks. Okay. You sign up one at a time, so you can sign up really at any time to join in. And uh, it's, uh, it, it is about, uh, it's, uh, it's about looking at life uh, with this whole background of... Uh, spiritual traditions, mythology, alchemy, uh, did I say mythology, depth psychology, Jungian psychology, the archetypal psychology of James Hillman, putting all that together, a very, very rich uh, blend of psychology and the arts and the spiritualities. And uh, that's what I'm uh, teaching this year. And uh, it's, I'm finding it quite, quite wonderful. Wow, that does sound like an amazing course. And if people want to find out more about it, do they go to your website? Yes, thomasmoresoul.com. thomasmoresoul.com. And there they can find information about any books and yes. upcoming books and so All forth. All the books are there. Everything is there, yes. Brilliant. Fantastic, Thomas. Thank you so much again. And um, wishing you well on, on your journey this, this, this year into your 80th year. And... Um, Thank you. May I say, Will, before we finish, to thank you for this very intelligent and enjoyable conversation and your whole concept. And I want to thank you for helping me in the past and giving me such uh, wonderful experiences. I'll never forget our being in Gl uh, Gloucester Cathedral and other places uh, and enjoying, enjoying it so much. And I wish you well with your family and with your work. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, Okay, so um, see you see you soon, hopefully down the line. Let's when you're, hope. When, you're, when you're next in uh, ex, next in the UK. Next, I can get there. Believe me, I'll be there. Okay, I'll let Great. you know. Let's keep in touch. Okay, bye, okay, Thomas. Bye. bye. Thank you for listening to Follow Your Blisters. If you've enjoyed this episode, please stay tuned for more lively, inspiring conversations released bi-weekly on Wednesdays on Apple Podcasts, slash iTunes, Spotify, and other channels. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, where any reviews would be hugely appreciated. You can also find out more about this podcast on ConsciousFrontiers.com, where you can sign up to receive news and updates. Big thanks go to Ike Morland for editing and recording this podcast, to Michael Tyak for the music, and to GFM Radio here in Glastonbury for lending me their studio. Finally, if you have friends who you think would enjoy or benefit from this podcast, please do spread the word. Thanks a million. <laughs>